Would you take your Bibles tonight? I want you to open to the book of Hebrews, chapter 13. We're going to come back to our study in Kings next year. (laughs) Hebrews chapter 13. I want to speak tonight on how to live without fear in a new year. Most of us are afraid of the unknown. That's just human nature. And we don't know what this next year is going to bring. I heard of uh, some men years ago when they were on a leaky old ship in the middle of a rough and stormy sea, and they were actually fearing for their lives. And they didn't know whether they were going to sink or not. And so one of them went to see the captain and said, Captain, are we safe? And he said, well, I'll put it to you this way. He said, the boilers on this ship are very weak, and we may explode at any moment. But he said, the ship is very old. It's taking on water. He said, uh, to be honest with you, we may have an explosion or we may sink. He said, we may go up or we may go down, but at any rate, we're going on. And that's the way it is as we face a new year. Jesus might come and we might go up. I'd be okay with that. We might die and go down and then go up, but at any rate, we're going on. Isn't that true? We're moving forward and we're facing a brand new year. And we don't know what this year is going to bring. You know, the old map makers, before they had modern instruments that we have uh, today, when they would draw out maps, they would draw as much as they knew, as much as they had explored. And when they got to the end of their knowledge and the end of their exploration, they could put no more down on the map. They would just write on the edge of the map, beyond this there be dragons. And uh, now they've never seen a dragon. They probably weren't really sure what a dragon was, but uh, they would always think of the future in that way. We don't know what's out there. We don't know what's beyond this, and there might be dragons. They were afraid of the unknown. Well, actually, beyond that, there might be golden beaches and fields and rivers of of gold and, and beautiful things. But as far as they were concerned, the unknown was a fearful thing, and it was like dragons to them. And that's the way maybe some people feel about the future. Maybe you're a little bit afraid about moving into 2021. I mean, look at 2020. How many of us ever would have guessed some of the things that we've seen, incredible things that we've seen in 2020? We've seen financial instability. We've seen riots. We've seen injustice committed by those that are in authority. We've seen terrorism and murder, and we've seen bombings. And worst of all is this pandemic, and uh, we're hoping that things get back to normal. We don't know when that's going to happen, if there ever will be a new, uh, the old normal. Uh, We're just not sure. We don't know. Uh, To be honest with you, I was looking forward to going over and visiting um, my daughter in the UK. In fact, I I should be over there now. I was scheduled to go over there, my wife and I. And uh, but you know, with everything that's going over there, of course, they have a new. Uh, mute, uh, mutation from COVID, a new strain of COVID. So they've shut everything down, and now there's the fear of that coming to the U.S. In fact, I read a report today where supposedly this new strain of COVID they found in Colorado, um, and so they're concerned about what that might bring. And all these things kind of fill our hearts with fear. And sometimes as we think about the future and these things that we just don't know how are going to turn out, our hearts are filled with fear. But can I tell you very uh, forcefully and with conviction that God does not want us living in fear. He does not want us to live in fear. The Bible says God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So how do we avoid living in fear or anxiety when we think about the unknown future. Well, there's a lot of promises in the Bible we can turn to, and I hope that you'll take advantage of the time, maybe some days you have as you prepare for the new year and look at some of those promises. But I want to show you one here tonight that's always been a help to me, and I hope it'll be a help to you. I know this is not new to you, but we need to go back and look at it again. In Hebrews chapter 13, look down at verse number 5 and verse number 6. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. This is a wonderful promise from God's word. These are some great verses here. And I want us to look at these, and I want us to think about three things 
And hopefully these things will help us to live without anxiety and fear as we uh, approach a, a new year. So number one, I would say this. If you want to live without this anxiety and fear in your life, number one, be content with God's provision. Be content with God's provision. In verse 5, again, he says, let your conversation, that word conversation is kind of a King, old King James word, just lifestyle. Uh, let your lifestyle, keep your life free from covetousness, or uh, we could say the love of money. Um, with the economy hit hard by the COVID, many people are concerned and worried about money. How are they going to take care of their family? And God is basically telling us, you know, don't be afraid of that. You will not. If you're a child of God, listen to me very carefully. You're not going to lack God's provision. He's going to take care of you. Can I tell you again, if you belong to the Lord, he's going to watch over his own. He's going to take care of his children. He just does. He always does. Listen to this verse in Philippians 4.19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You know what? The U.S. might run out of money to give out, but can I tell you, God's never going to run out of uh, provision. He's never going to run out of supply. God says, I'm going to provide all that you need according to my riches in glory. That's a promise from God that you can take to the bank. But now just remember this now. This is a promise from God to meet all of your needs. And as the old saying goes, he promised to meet your needs, not your what? Not your greeds, right? This is not a verse that can furnish a greedy lifestyle. We have to be careful that we don't allow our concern for money or provision to turn in an obsession to where that's all we think about, or that we even get greedy. We don't ever seem to get enough. Whatever we get, it's not enough, and we always want more. Many of the Hebrew Christians that the writer was writing to had suffered loss, and the writer kind of gives them a warning, now don't get obsessed about your provisions and money. In fact, he says, let your lifestyle be, look at the word without covetousness there in verse number five. That's one word in the Greek. It's ah, which is the alpha negative, not phileo, loving, agoros, silver, or not loving money. It's this thing to where you're never really fully satisfied. No matter how much you get, you want more. It's that attitude that uh, one uh, millionaire was asked uh, when he said, how much is enough? He said, well, I, another million at least. The philosopher Immanuel Kant saw this and he observed and he said, give a man everything he wants and at that moment everything will not be everything. And so the writer gives us kind of a negative exhortation. Uh, don't be covetous. Don't be covetous or let your lifestyle be without covetousness. And then he kind of gives a positive reinforcement. Look again at verse number 5, and be content with such things as you have. In other words, you need to work at learning to be content. Now, this doesn't come natural for us. You know why? Because we're sinners, because our hearts are prone to want more. That's part of the sin nature. We just seem to always want more and more. And so, we have to understand that about ourselves, that in our heart, contentment is not something that is, that is natural. It's something that we have to learn. What is contentment? Well, it is this gracious spirit which submits to and delights in the things that God in his wisdom disposes to us, gives to us, and whatever circumstance that he puts us. John Owen, when he was t- talking about this, he said, it's a gracious frame, a disposition of mind. It's a quiet spirit without complaining at God's providential disposals, he said. It's without without envying those who have maybe perhaps more than we have, without fear or anxiety about future supplies. You're not worried about tomorrow and what you're going to get there. Without desires and designs of those that uh, which a more plentiful condition that we have would supply us with. In other words, we're not concerned about those who might have more. It's just a, a submission to the providential hand of God in our life. This is not something that would be nice for us to have according to Scripture. God says this is something that we need. You need to learn to be content. Uh, this is a cause of a lot of fear when we're not content. 
1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8, write this verse down. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. The Bible says if you learn to be content with God's provision, that's great gain in your life. Because you brought nothing into this world, you're not going to take anything with you. And so contentment is something that we need to work for. We need to strive for in our own life. Um, We think there are things that we have to have. We have to have it. And God in his wisdom knows that if he gave that to us, it wouldn't be good for us. We think it would be good for us. But you know this? Are you ready to submit to this? God knows you better than you know yourself. And he knows what you need better than you know what you need. I heard about uh, two tears who met in, along in the river of life. And one tear said to the other tear, where did you come from? And this tear said, well, I'm the tear of a girl who loved a man and lost him. Where did you come from? And the other tear said, well, I'm the tear of the girl who found him and married him. And the point is, we think we really need something, and God says it's really not needful for you. Besides, remember this, material things can never make us content understand that? We're just not wired that way. It's kind of probably hard after Christmas when you got all those gifts. But material things do not make people content. The Bible says this in Ecclesiastes 5.10, he that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver. He that loveth abundance with increase, this also is vanity. Solomon is saying, look, you know, this isn't going to make you happy. Having a lot It's not going to make you happy. That's not what brings contentment. And by the way, Solomon would know, right? I mean, he was pretty rich. I think I told you before that someone estimated his income at $75 million a week. He literally had the world. If you read Ecclesiastes 2, he said, whatever my eyes saw, I wanted, I got it. He said, whatever my heart desired, I didn't withhold any joy from my heart. If there's something my heart desired, I went and I got it. Solomon said, I got on Amazon, I clicked it on, I got it. He said, whatever goal I had, whatever uh, thing I tried to achieve, I was able to do it. He had everything. You say, man, he must have been gloriously happy. No, he said in Ecclesiastes 2.17, therefore I hated life. You know why? Because he's trying to fill his life with all these temporary material thrills and joys And what he found out was, that's just not the way you're wired. God did not wire you that way. He did not make your heart that way. And later on, he says this in Ecclesiastes 3.11. He said, God has set ha'olam, eternity in man's heart. You know what that means? You know, and all people know instinctively, that there's more than just this temporal world that there's more than just these material possessions, that there's an eternity. Did you know man knows instinctively that there's something after life here? That's why, you know, you study ancient cultures, and what do you find? They had one common denominator when they buried their dead. They all had a sense that that wasn't all that there was, that there was a life after that. That's why, you know, um, you, know you have certain people groups that when they bury their dead, they bury it with things that they think that they can take with them. You know, you've got the pharaohs over there in Egypt being buried with all this gold. You've got people being buried in, in uh, the Greek culture with coins in their eyes. Why? So they can pay the fare to get across the Mystic River for the afterlife. Why? Because every, every people group, every culture of all mankind know instinctively in their heart that there's an eternity that this temporal life is not all that there is. And that God, when he created the heart of man, created that heart to be satisfied with our relationship to the eternal, not the temporal. If you try to replace your relationship to the eternal one, God, or Jesus Christ, or eternity in heaven with him, then if you try to replace it with just these things here on earth, you know what? You're going to find that they are cheap substitutes. doesn't work. Your heart was created to be satisfied with an eternal relationship with God through Jesus Christ and all that eternity gives. And that's why there's so much discontentment in the world. 
because the world still is throwing out that lie that you're never going to be happy unless you have this. In fact, another reason why it's so difficult to be content is because the world is constantly telling you to be discontent. And that's how they sell you products. That's what advertising does. That's what, that's what the TV commercials do. You know, you were fine until that commercial came on that told you you had to have this. Suddenly, you get out your computer and you are on Amazon looking for that. I've got to have this. Thinking, man, if I have this, it's going to make me happy. But we weren't created that way. Did you know, according to one study, they, they said that, according to the book by Randy Alcorn, when he did a study on this called The Treasure Principle, he said that the average American sees over a million commercials by age 20. A million. All of them telling you that you need something. I don't know how he came up with that number, but it averages out to 137 per day commercials if you watch TV and you listen to the radio and all these other things. And even if a fraction of that is true, you're constantly being bombarded with this idea that you're not going to be happy unless you get this certain product or this certain thing. And the world is telling you to be discontent. And God is telling you, look, none of those things are going to make you content. The only thing that will is your connection to me, your relationship to God. That's what brings contentment. That's why Paul could say in Philippians, I have learned in whatsoever state I am to be content. That's why he said, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Now, we love to quote that verse, and it looks good on a T-shirt. But you know what? That verse was given in the context of learning to be content. And you know how you do that? You know how you can learn that and you can do all things, and the all things there are simply meant. I know know how to live with a lot and not get obsessed with having things. I know how to live with a little. I know how to be a base. Paul said, I know how to abound. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Paul understood the secret that true contentment comes with your relationship and knowing Jesus and getting close to Christ and walking with him. And if you have that, then you have contentment and you're ready for this. Then you're fully able to enjoy these other gifts a whole lot better if you're not looking to those gifts for contentment. I get my contentment from Jesus Christ and all these other things, these are just side issues. These are gifts that he gives me, but they don't replace Christ in my heart. They are an overflow of the contentment I've learned to have in Christ alone. If he takes them away, I'm okay with that. If he gives me more, I'm okay with that. Either way, I'm content in Jesus Christ because that's where the true contentment comes from. And so the writer is saying, look, don't have a life of covetousness, but learn to be content. Your contentment comes from the Lord, and you know what? God is going to take care of you. He just will. Now, some of you are saying, but pastor, our nation is headed down the drain economically. The national debt is $27 trillion. People are losing jobs. And I'm afraid that God is judging this country. Well, that all may be true, but let me just tell you this. Do you know that God is able to judge the ungodly and at the same time take care of his own people? You think that he could do both at the same time? Of course, we see it in Scripture. God judged the Egyptians, but he was good to his own people, Israel. God knows how to judge the ungodly and deliver his own people out of that judgment. Second Peter 2.9, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. You say, well, Preacher, I'm worried about my children and my grandchildren. What's it going to be like for them? Well, let me give you a verse, Psalm 37, verse 25. I've been young and now I'm old, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. Isn't that a good verse? Write that down. So number one, be content with God's provision. But here's the second thing. Be comforted with God's presence. Because look again what he says in verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness. And be content with such things as you have, for he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Again, this is just a wonderful verse. I don't know what I'm going to face next year, but I know one thing. 
I'm not going to face it alone. I'm going to have God there with me to help me. I know he's not going to forsake me. That's a wonderful thing to know. In him I have all. And he will not leave me. He will not forsake me. He will not forsake you either. He will not leave you either. This might be the most encouraging verse in all the Bible. Now, again, we fear because we're afraid that we might have to face something in this next year that, that uh, is difficult. But again, I remind you, you're not going to face it alone. Jesus said, I will never leave you. You know, Greek scholars tell us that in this sentence, uh, it actually has five negatives in it. We can say a double negative in English is bad, but it wasn't bad in Greek. It was actually good. Here's what it literally says. If I gave you a literal rendering, I will never, no, not ever, no, never leave you nor forsake you. Let me give that to you again. This is the force of it. I will never, no, not ever, no, never leave you nor forsake you. That's strong. One young preacher was trying to explain this to a dear old saint, and he was trying to say, you know, the Lord says it five times. And she said, well, you know, God might have to say it five times to you Greek fellers, but once is enough for me. And the word leave or forsake literally means abandon. God says, I'm not going to abandon you. I'm not going to give up on you. I'm not going to leave you helpless like you're some orphan. I'm not going to forsake you. This verse speaks to spouses who are alone because perhaps your spouse left you, walked out on you. It speaks to some children who feel that they've been forsaken by their parents. This verse talks to uh, love, uh, people who've lost loved ones and you feel so very alone. God says, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to be with you. David Livingston, he used this a lot when he was over in Africa. You know the story of the great missionary. And on one time when he was in the deepest, dangerous part of Africa, he wrote in his journal on January 14, 1856, that he was surrounded by hostile people, and it didn't look good for him. And he wrote about that, but one thing he wrote was he remembered the verse where God says, I will not leave you, I am with you. And then he wrote, this is the word of a gentleman of the most strict and sacred honor. And then he said, simply said, okay, Lord, I'm going to leave this up to you then. And so he felt the fear leave, and he went to sleep that night, and God watched over him because that verse meant so much to him. God will not leave you. When you're discouraged, his presence will come along and help you. When you're lonely, his presence will cheer you. When you're worried, his presence will calm you. And when you're tempted, his presence will come alongside you and strengthen you in that time. I love this uh, verse in the song that we sing, How Firm a Foundation. Listen, the soul that on, Jesus, that on Jesus has leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. So be comforted with that. Be content with God's provision. Be comforted with God's presence. But here's the last thing. Be confident in his protection. Look again in verse 6. Notice what he says in verse 6. So that we might boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Uh, so this is, again, just a powerful verse. Notice it's he has said, so that in verse 5, for he has said, and then in verse 6, it picks up that we might boldly say. I, I love that because I think that right there to me defines what real faith is. You know what real faith is? Real faith is boldly saying what God has already said. That's faith. You know, we have a lot of people out here that try to tell you to, you know, put your, you know, that faith in itself, there's something magical about the quality of faith. If you just believe, you can write your own destiny. If you just believe, you know, we got books out there like, you know, The Secret or, you know, some of these other books that, that kind of give that kind of bizarre theology that, you know, there's power, there's power in just faith. But faith in itself is nothing unless the faith is rooted in the right thing. 
Real faith is faith in God and his word. That's what real faith is. Real faith is boldly saying what God has already said. I don't have the right to just say, this is what's going to happen, and I put my faith in that. You're not sovereign. God is. God is the one who's sovereign. And you can claim and you can boldly say what God has said. And notice the character of the promise keeper. A promise is no better than the one who makes it. Isn't that true? Someone make you a promise in 2020 and said, oh, I'm going to do this. And, and then, you know, when it came crunch time, they weren't there. You know, like the insurance company, Allstate, you're in good hands until there's a crash. Whoops. You're no longer in good hands. The promise is no better than the character and integrity of the one who makes that promise. Isn't that true? Who is the one that's promising this? It's God. And God doesn't change. God doesn't have a bad day. God is the same. This is why we glory in one of, this, one of the attributes of God, his immutability, where God says, I, I change not. If God promised you something in Scripture, you can rest assured he doesn't turn back on that promise. He doesn't change his mind about it. He's going to do what he said. And so we see then here the character of the promise keeper. When God says something, you can bank on it. But then we also see the confession of the promise claimer. Again, he has said... So we can boldly say, again, faith is simply and boldly saying what God has already said. Because God said, I will not leave you nor forsake you. Notice the first thing those who claim this promise can confess. What can we boldly say? If God says, I'm not going to leave you or forsake you, what can I boldly say then based upon that? Look look what it says in verse 6. So we may boldly say what? The Lord is my what? Helper. I can say that with all boldness. I can tell you without any doubt, God is my helper. The Lord is my helper. I can say that boldly because of what he has already said. I don't come to the unknown and say, there be dragons. I come to the edge of the unknown and I say, the Lord is my helper. God is my helper. I'm not afraid to walk into the unknown. And notice the second thing that those who claim this promise can say in verse number 6. And look at the rest of it. And I will not fear what men shall do unto me. Not afraid of what others can do unto me. Now, let's be clear. This promise does not mean everything for you is going to go smooth. doesn't mean that. The Hebrew Christians being addressed in this letter were going through very difficult times. They faced heartaches. They faced trials. Those to whom this was written were facing opposition from family, opposition from friends and foes. They were facing mockery. They were facing brutality and robbery. In fact, some of them had their goods stolen from them. And the Bible says in Hebrews 10:36 that they looked at they took that joyfully because they were focused on the eternal just like they should be. And so it's not saying that everything is going to be all roses and no thorns. That's not what God is saying here. Again, we don't know what the new year is going to hold for us. We don't know what kind of challenges we're going to have to face. But no matter what you face, you can say this, the Lord is my helper. He's going to help me through this. When you walk through the valley, God said, I'm going to walk through this with you. You're not going to be there by yourself. Isaiah 43, 2, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. The flame shall not consume you. Why? Because God will be there with you. He's going to help you. I love this story about Alexander McLaren. Alexander McLaren is a great Scottish Bible expositor. I have about about 20 of his books on a set in my office, and uh, we'll refer to them from time to time. But when he was just a boy, 16 years old, He got his first job that was away from home. It was in Glasgow. He lived on a farm and uh, worked on a farm with his dad, but this uh, job was in Glasgow, and he had never been there. And it It was about five or six miles there, so he couldn't just go every day. So he decided he would go during the week and stay there and work, and then, you know, he would come home on the weekends. And his dad said to him on the first week, he said, look, 
he said, um, Alexander, he said, look, this will be your first time away from home, and your, your mom and I, we're going to miss you. So we want you, when you get off work on Friday, we want you to come home, walk home immediately, because we want to spend the weekend with you starting on Friday night. And Alexander knew that between his farm and Glasgow, there was a deep, dark ravine, a very deep valley that had had, had people uh, had been murdered there and robbed there. It was a very fearful thing to walk through that ravine. And he didn't want to walk through that ravine at, at Friday night. It would be dark by the time he got there. And he didn't want to reveal to his dad that he was afraid to walk through there. So he just said, Dad, you know what? Why don't I just sleep Friday night and then Saturday morning I'll get up and I'll walk home? And his father said, no, Alexander, we want you home Friday night. And so he said, okay. So after he got off work on Friday night, he started walking home to his farmhouse, and he got to the edge of the ravine, and his heart began to beat faster, thumping in his bosom. And so he just started walking through that ravine, and he began to whistle. He thought that would help him feel better, (laughs) so he was whistling, and Then he started talking to an imaginary companion, hoping if anyone could hear him that they would thought there was more than one person there. And that really didn't help much either. And then while he was there walking in that valley, he heard someone. And he could see the silhouette of someone approaching him, and his heart was just racing. But when that person got closer out of the darkness, he saw who it was. It was his father. His father came to him. And he said, Alex, I came to meet you. I was so lonely for you. I couldn't wait for you to get back to the farm. I I thought I'd come out here and meet you and walk back with you. And Alexander McLaren said, you'll never know the difference that 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 made. He said, all the fear that I had was gone. All the anxiety that I had was gone. He said, we walked through that valley. And he said, I had wonderful fellowship because my father was there right now beside me. It made all the difference. Now, friend, I don't know what valley you might have to walk through in the next year, but I can tell you this, you're not going to walk it alone. And God's presence makes all the difference in our life. So read this verse one more time as we close. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. Be content with God's provision. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, be comforted with God's presence, so that we might boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Be confident with God's protection. Let's bow for prayer tonight. And so, Father, tonight we look to you as our helper. What a comfort it is to say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. I pray, Lord, that we would claim this verse for ourselves, as we stand on the edge of the unknown. Rather than say what others have said, there be dragons, we say, the Lord is my helper. Father, may it be so in every heart. Strengthen us so that we can live without fear in a new year. And may we be a testimony to those around us because we know, Lord, that there are many that live in fear in these times. But let when people look at us, may they see the courage that comes from knowing Christ and having his presence in our life. And we pray all this in Jesus' wonderful, matchless name. Amen.